Hello everybody, it's the festive season, and how could this joyous COVID-driven yuletide be complete without a U3A pantomime? Well, in my opinion, virtually anything would be complete without a U3A pantomime, but I've been prevailed upon to produce one anyway. On hearing that I was writing one, many people came forward with suggestions, but I've ignored them, chiefly because most of them were anatomically impossible, and I decided to do it anyway. One old lady member suggested that I should do that one about the cat in the chemists. I eventually realised that she was referring to Puss in Boots. This year's pantomime is going to be performed via the wonders of Zoom by the Krikowal U3A Play Reading Repertory Company. And so, as the music fades away, live, or more accurately half alive as it's the U3A, we present the story of Cinderella. And now you've heard what I have told, we'll let our little play unfold. As off to Neverland we go, to hear a tale that you'll all know. We'll have some fun, there could be frolics, though most of you will think it's... In the land of Never Never and far away, just beyond Merthyr Tydfil, there was once a magical kingdom. It was a kingdom that had its own laws and ways of doing things, which made it pretty much the same as the rest of Wales, except for the fact that it didn't decide to close down for a fortnight whenever it felt like it. Within that little kingdom, there lived a beautiful young girl named Cinderella. She lived in a large old house named Hardup Hall, where she was forced to wait on her wicked stepmother and her two ugly wicked stepsisters, Beatrice and Eugenie. As our story opens, we find Cinderella by the fireside, she sits among the cinders, a rosy glow upon her cheeks. Hurry up, Cinderella! You've still got to re -led the roof and build the Cardiff Parkway Station project, along with its adjoining Hendrew Lakes commercial development on that 200-acre site in St Melons before you make up the evening fire. Yes, stepsister. And don't forget to bring in the coal and scrap the kitchen floor. Yes, stepsister. You really are a slattern, Cinderella, whatever that means. Look, daughters, we have just received an invitation to a really posh event at the palace. It's no jeans and over 60s only, which means the whole cast will be eligible to go. It seems that the prince is holding a ball because he's looking for a wife. Oh my, imagine if I was chosen to be the prince's bride. You? That'd be absurd. If the prince has eyes for anyone, it will be for me. When the prince sets eyes on me, you realise I've got something that our girls haven't. Yes, a bus pass and a hearing aid. Me and the entire cast here. Anyway, you're one to talk. We may be twins, Eugenie, but you're fat, balding and ugly. Yes, but don't forget that I'm considered to be the pretty one. Not only do Cinderella's ugly sisters pick on her as well as each other all day long, but to make matters worse, they're not even sisters. In fact, they're not even women. They're actually just a couple of blokes in the Krikowal U3A who've been hastily drafted in to make up the numbers, a fact that is amply reflected in their performance. Excuse me for asking, Stepmama, but is everyone invited to the Prince's Ball? Everyone who is anyone, yes. Why do you ask? Do you think it would be possible for me to go to the ball? You? 
Don't be absurd, Cinderella. Who would look twice at you, a scullery maid, dressing rags? They'd either take you for a beggar or think you were wearing some dress designed by Vivian Westwood. And to be quite frank, I'm not sure which would be worse. The scene changes. October slips into November. November barges into December. And soon it is the day of the Prince's Ball. That evening, after Eugenie, Beatrice, together with Cinderella's stepmother, have all left for the ball, Cinderella's faithful friend Buttons tries to cheer her up as she gazes wistfully into the flames sat by the dying embers of the fire in a small ingle nook. That's a lovely ingle nook, Cinder. Thank you. I knitted it myself. You look sad, Cinder. I am. I wish I had been able to attend the Prince's Ball. Even my stepsister Beatrice has gone, and she doesn't even have a decent microphone. Oh, dear sweet buttons, you are my only friend. And like myself, you are but a humble servant. I know that. Yes, but the listeners don't. I am so sad, Buttons, for my stepmother and stepsisters have all gone to the Prince's Ball, leaving me here all alone amongst the cinders. Oh, dear. <laughs> Don't cry, cinders, for I have a present for you. Gosh, thank you, dear Buttons. Turn around. Now, turn back. Socks. And they're warm. Are they heated socks? No. I only just took them off. They're all I have to give you, Cinderella, for I'm just as poor as you are. Oh, faithful buttons, I wish I had something to offer you in return. Maybe you do. Don't start that again. Besides, after tending after my wicked stepmother and stepsisters, I am simply too tired to think of anything else. And also, do not forget, Faithful Buttons, that I am a fair, unsullied virgin. Now that's what I call acting. Besides, after tending to my wicked stepmother and stepsisters, I am simply too tired to think of anything else. Oh dear, sweet Buttons, sometimes after completing all my chores, I feel quite faint with hunger. My dear old mother told me that if I felt that way, I ought to put my head between my knees. Do you think it might help if I did that, Buttons? I don't know, but it's worth a try. Hang about. If my arthritis isn't playing up, I'll see if I can open my legs wide enough for you. <laughs> There you go again, you saucy buttons. Can't help it, Cinders. Remember, it was me who christened you, Cinders, because I think you're a hot bit of stuff. Oh, well, I suppose I must finish blacking the grate, Faithful Buttons, even though it's not easy, because I'm not sure what it means. Yes, and I must return to my job as boot boy. They probably want to give me a couple of boots tomorrow, and I'd better go and prepare for it. <laughs> And so, as Buttons leaves to stuff several phone books down the back of his trousers, Cinderella finds herself alone beside the glowing embers of the dying fire, which twinkles lazily in the grate of the Great Hall's baronial fireplace. Cinderella tries her best to remain philosophical about being left all alone on a Saturday night. Well, it could be worse. Once I finish blacking the grate, I'll have no work to do, and at least television hasn't been invented yet, so I won't have to watch Casualty. Suddenly, there is a blinding flash of light, and what sounds like a small explosion. Bloody fuses! Honestly, these old houses are death traps. Only it wasn't a fuse this time, for there, in front of Cinderella, Clad in a fluted de la Valle damask dress of the purest white, stands the strangest figure who has suddenly appeared in a puff of smoke. May I help you 
help you off with your puff of smoke? Thank you, my dear. Now allow me to introduce myself. I am your fairy odd mother. I think there's been a typing error. Oh yes, sorry. I'm your very old mother. And believe me, even in the U3A, they don't come much older than I am. You are strange to me, fairy old mother. I'm pretty strange to everyone, dearie. But why are you clad in radiant, shimmering, glittering, Samite garb? Where have you come from? I come from a land where silver towers rise high into the sky. The food is varied and plentiful, but people live lives of leisure they drink deeply from the cup of knowledge. Cardiff Bay? No fairyland. I've come to help you, Cinderella, for you shall go to the Prince's Ball. But first I need a pumpkin, a white mouse, and a couple of rats. This isn't some recipe off MasterChef, is it? No, I will turn them into a coach and horses, and they shall take you to the ball. Wouldn't it be easier to call a minicab? What would be the fun in that? Very well, I do actually happen to have a pumpkin here. Oh, fortuitous. Now bring me all the rats and mice you can. That is easy, for I am friends with all the little creatures in the house. They sit with me beside the hearth and warm themselves each night. Sometimes we huddle together for warmth. How disgusting. Come to me, little creatures of the night. <laughs> What's that? A sheep. I think he got in down the chimney. How do you assemble all the rats and mice you can find? Yes, fairy old mother. Good. Now, put this rat poison down. I really don't know how you can live like that. But they are my only friends, fairy old mother. Apart from buttons. You must be unhinged, girl. Who ever heard of anyone making friends with vermin? Let alone some type of fastener. Anyway, back to the plot. Such as it is. Cinderella, find me two rats and one white mouse. Here you are. That was quick. And watch this. I'm going to wave my little wand about and amazing things will happen. They certainly did last time. What happened the last time? I got off with a suspended sentence. Right, now I'll recite the magic words that always make amazing things happen. Mark Drakeford! Oh dear, everything suddenly shut down, and there's nowhere to buy sanitary products. I'd better try again. As if by magic, which it actually is, the two elderly rats turn into two elderly horses, and the white mouse transforms into a fairy coach driver. Goodness me, the two rats have become two magnificent, albeit elderly, horses. And the white mouse has become a fairy coach driver. I just said that. Sorry. Oh, hello, love. I'm your fairy coach driver. Goodness. And look, the pumpkin has been transformed into a coach. Hi, my name's Wayne Pivak. I used to coach the Welsh National Rugby Squad. And under the government's COVID crisis retraining scheme, next week I'll be starting work in Spa. Oh dear, wrong coach. Let me try again. Oh, that's better. Now let's change you out of those dirty old rags. Nothing's happened. Oh, drats. I'm sorry, my dear. I'm breaking in the new one, you see. I'm still not very good at changing gear. Let me try once more. There we are. A silken ball round, edged with ermine and speckled with diamond brocade. Oh, that's really lovely, dear. But shouldn't Cinderella be wearing it rather than me? After mistakenly decking the cockroaches out in spangled leotards. Oh, you look lovely, Gerald. Oh, thanks. You don't look so bad yourself, see. And kitting the sheep out in Prada. Ah, my 
it would do without the woolen sweater. But the linear rosa sunglasses are really me. <laughs> Eventually, Cinderella's fairy old mother succeeds in transforming Cinderella's clothing, and in a twinkling, off she goes in her pumpkin coach en route to the palace ball. As they clip clop along the heads of the valley's road towards the palace, the fairy coachman chats to Cinderella. That's a lovely twinkling you've got on, dear. It's ever so you. Thank you very much, coachman. It's much nicer than this old silken gown your fairy old mum clobbered me up in. I had the big bad wolf in the back of this carriage once, you know. He's an absolute sweetie. Not at all like how them pigs made him out to be in the stories. And the wicked queen, well, I love nothing bad said about her. She's very generous with her tips. Here, yeah, what do you reckon on all them trolls coming into the country and taking our jobs? I think it's an absolute scandal, Miss Elf. If I had my way, I'd stop them from coming... Shut up and drive! Right you are, madam. But before I do, I'll have to give you a warning. You must leave the Prince's Palace before ten o'clock or great misfortune will befall you. Ten o'clock? Why is that? I don't know. I expect that's when they shut the bar, love. I wonder what sort of misfortune it might be. No good asking me, love. I was just asked to pass on the message by your fairy old mum. Don't shoot the messenger, dear. Hello. The sound effects have stopped. We must be here. I won't get down if you don't mind. I might dirty my frock. And so Cinderella disembarks from her fairy carriage and walks slowly up the stone steps that lead to the palace ballroom. All eyes are upon her as she enters. And she is soon to find out why. Excuse me, madam. I'm afraid this is a masked ball. You will have to put your antiviral mask on. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. As Cinderella swears and wrestles with the elasticated ear loops on her leopard print antiviral mask, in another corner of the palace ballroom, Prince Charming is chatting animatedly to a figure. I'm Dick Whittington and this is my cat. Meow. I'm afraid you're in the wrong story. And tell your cat to put his antiviral mask on or he'll have to leave. Meow. Just then, King Creole, the prince's elderly father, comes up to him. Have you spotted a likely filly you'd like to tie the knot with yet, Charming? No, father, not yet. What about the Princess Aurora over there? She's got a pretty leg on her. Yes. Pity about the rest of her. Well then, what about Princess Griselda? She's got massive endowments. I think not. Well, make your mind up regarding somebody, boy. Remember, if you're not married by the age of 70, this entire kingdom goes to Tom Thumb. But he's only 12 inches high. Yes, but a great many people think he'd make an excellent ruler. Choose someone, son. We have the cream of high society here today. Yes, but I'm afraid that most of it appears to have curdled, father. Wait, though. <gasps> Who is that ravaging vision of loveliness just over there? That's one of the waiters. For God's sake, put your glasses on. I don't like to. They make me look old. That's because you are old. Anyway, you know what happens when you don't wear them. I could have died of embarrassment when we visited that hospital last week and you asked that medicine cupboard what it did for a living. Ah. Good evening to you, Prince. May I say how honoured I am to be here? I knew you had big balls, but I never dreamt that I would actually ever get to see one of them. Get in there, boy. Shush, father. To whom do I have the honour of addressing? I am Cinderella. A name whose loveliness is only surpassed by your beauty. 
or at least that bit of it I can see poking out above your leopard print antiviral mask. You flatter me, Prince. May I be so bold as to ask a question? Of course. Why are all those birds flying about the ballroom? We had to pretend it was a grouse shoot in order to be able to invite 30 people. As long as the servants remember to shoot one every few minutes, we're not breaking quarantine regulations. Well shot, sir. The main meal will be grouse and pheasant. It always is, ever since we've been forced to fill the palace with birds. My sister got sick of eating them for a while, but she seemed to have redeveloped her appetite for it. Father said it's good to see her back on the game again. Would you care to try some caviar? It's one of the few things we serve that isn't grouse related. Caviar? Oh, is that what it is? I thought the blackberry jam smelled a bit funny. Your wit does you credit, madam, and is only surpassed by that bit of beauty your mask permits me to see a bit of. What further comeliness lies beneath it, I cannot help but wonder. It would be bliss indeed to gaze upon your mouth and nose. Perhaps we could stroll in the gardens later, and you would permit me to remove it. I'm afraid that my nose is attached to my face, and would therefore be impossible to remove, sweet prince. But I would be most happy to remove my mask in an alfresco environment. They really are the most terrible inconvenience, aren't they? Not always. Last week, when I had a particularly bad attack of gingivitis, I was able to go to three state openings without having to put my teeth in. How lovely for you. Yes, and quite often nowadays I can open the odd nightingale ward without even bothering to shave. Would you care to dance? I'd love to, but what will you do? Remember, in order to protect us from the fairy flu, we must stay one metre apart. Nonetheless, I would be honoured to accompany you. In that case, certainly. I think there's a piano over there. Well, everybody seems to be getting on. Yes, they have to be. You're not allowed to be in the U3A otherwise. Cinderella and Prince Charming whirl about the dance floor, occasionally knocking down other dancers with his piano. Cinderella finds herself caught up in a giddy carousel of merriment. Dancers swirl around the dance floor like dervishes. Joy knows no bounds. Eventually, two members of the palace guard have to throw her out. Then, just as Cinderella and the prince are quietly stealing away from the other guests to make their way through the French windows that lead to the palace garden, Cinderella hears the ballroom's great clock begin to strike. As the clock begins to strike 10 p.m., Cinderella remembers what the fairy coachman said to her. Ah, oh, that big bad wolf in the back of my carriage once. Not that bit. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> you must leave the prince's palace before 10 o'clock, or great misfortune will befall you. Leaving the prince's side, Cinderella runs from the ballroom. Down the marble staircase she goes, then out into the open air, where she rips her antiviral mask off, allowing it to fall to the ground. Thank God for that! She is only just in time. A glittering ball gown begins to shimmer, then turns back into the dowdy rags she normally wears. The glittering coach that took her to the ball, and which still stands outside, also begins to shimmer, 
then turns into a pumpkin with a dead mouse on top and two dead rats by the side of it. Oh dear, I knew I shouldn't have done what my fairy old mother said and put that wolfer in down. As Cinderella vanishes into the night, Prince Charming pursues her, rushing down the stairs as fast as his stand of stair lift will take him. Come back! Come back! Hello everyone, I represent the U3A and I'm just butting into this little playlet to say that it's a depiction of U3A members as being elderly, infirm, toothless and occasionally in need of stair lifts. Couldn't be further from the truth. The U3A is in actual fact, a thrusting, dynamic organisation, only a few of whose members need help or assistance in any way, be it physical or psychological. I myself am a vigorous lady member of this so-called Third Age organisation and have only recently come back from a trip to Peru, where I spent an entertaining few days followed by a fortnight's quarantine in a premier inn near Gatwick Airport. Whilst I was there in Peru, I mean not the Premier Inn, I climbed up to the ancient citadel of Machu Picchu. I was scarcely winded by the ascent, but by the time I got there, I had unfortunately completely forgotten why I decided to come, and so I had to go back down again in order to find out. I seem to have wandered off the subject in hand, now, what was I saying? Ah yes, I just thought I would set the record straight about the thrusting dynamism that lies at the very heart of the U3A before we let the fun continue. You can look forward to me occasionally breaking in, now and then, if I think that any further clarification might be necessary. Right. And now it's back to that thing with the slipper and the ugly sisters. The devil's a cold. Cinderella! Ah, yes, sorry. Back to Cinderella. <laughs> By the time Prince Charming's stairlift has reached the bottom of the palace steps, he discovers that not only is Cinderella nowhere to be seen, but that he has completely forgotten her name. I can't remember anything these days. If I go out at night, I have to ring someone up next day in order to find out whether I've enjoyed myself. The devil was her name. Salmonella or something. Glancing down, the prince glimpses something lying in the gutter. Painfully bending over, oh. he picks it up. Whosoever this fits will be my bride. That's a dead rat you've got there, boy. You really ought to wear your glasses, you know. The girl's antiviral mask is over here. The prince picks up the leopard print antiviral mask and examines it. There, within its folds, he sees that it still contains the indentation of Cinderella's nose. Whosoever's nose shall fit this antiviral mask will be my bride. Our narrative moves on apace, 
Neverland is all a Twitter with the latest news. A royal proclamation has been made, and posters have appeared all over the kingdom, announcing that Prince Charming seeks a mysterious woman whom he wishes to take for his wife. A woman whose face will fit an accidentally discarded leopard skin antiviral mask. It further states that the prince and his equerry plan to visit women the length and breadth of the kingdom. Trying it on. Get in there, boy. Quiet, father. I'm not a prize bull, you know. Meanwhile, back in Hard Up Hall, Cinderella's two ugly stepsisters, Beatrice and Eugenie, have seen the news and are both determined to become the prince's wife. I'm sure the prince will choose me. I am by far the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. You're not even the most beautiful woman in the room. I'm sure the prince will marry me. You're both wrong. What the prince needs is a mature woman, one with experience of the world. I shall marry the prince. A fearful storm rages that night. Suddenly hard up hall echoes to loud knocking as both of the hall's great brass door knockers clang in unison. Their twin thuds are echoing about its vestibule. A servant slowly approaches the outside door and opens it. It's a filthy night. Is that what you're selling? I'll see if the lady of the house is in need of one. No, indeed, stout fellow. My name is Prince Charming, and this is my equerry, Nigel. How do you do? You both sound oddly similar to one another. That's because we've both been played by the same person. Someone dropped out at the last minute. He phoned me to say he is a member that's feeling a bit peaky. Oh dear, that must be rather painful for him. Yes. That's why I've agreed to step in and play both parts. I see. Well, let's hope it doesn't give rise to any comic confusion later on in the story. Yes, let's hope so. Enough of this forward exposition. We travel the kingdom in order to find the person who would fit his antiviral mask. Open the casket that contains it, Nigel. Right you are. For that woman shall become my bride. Oh, I see. Well, can we come in? Didn't you see the sign? What sign? The one on the door that says no more than eight people in the hall at any one time. You'll have to wait. But I am the prince. I don't care if you're Dominic Cummings yourself, sir. You'll have to wait until two other people leave. Or, in this instance, since you both happen to be played by the same person, until one person leaves. In the meantime, may I be so bold as to draw your attention to that little bottle just down there by the boot scraper? Yes, well? It's an antiviral sanitizer spray, sir. Would you be kind enough to use it, please? Very well. Eventually, the prince is able to make entry, as Buttons has left Hard Up Hall to go into the village. A fact which proves doubly fortunate, as no more lines have been written for him. Goodbye, everyone. Except that one. Donning their royal antiviral masks, the prince and his equerry are met by Cinderella's stepmother and two stepsisters. I bid you greetings, Lady Hardup. You must wonder why I am abroad on a night like this. I'm not in the least surprised you're abroad. After all, my two daughters are transvestites. We're not transvestites, mother. We 
a We're transitioning. transitioning. It seems to be all the rage these days. I really do not know what the world's coming to. I don't. I only read in the paper this morning that apparently Little Miss Muffet now wants to be called Little Master Muffet and the three blind mice are petitioning for tiny guide dogs and prosthetic tails on the National Elf. Pardon me for interrupting your somewhat off-topic monologue, Lady Harder, but may I say, what a wonderful house you have. Your oak front door is a triumph of Neverland carpentry. Oh, I could not help but notice your two fabulous knockers. Well, actually, I think that... Hello! It's me from the U3A again. I'm just butting in to say that as an organisation, the U3A would like to politely distance itself from some of the more off-colour jokes that crop up rather too frequently in this little jeu d'esprit. I feel an obligation to point out to listeners that the U3A are, in actual fact, a culturally enlightened group of people much more at home with the works of Proust or the plays of Timberlake Burtonbaker than with the schoolboy innuendo and downright smut that seems to be on offer here. Right, now I've managed to set the record straight, let's get back to Babes in the Wood. Cinderella! Lady Hardup. I am travelling the length and breadth of my kingdom, seeking a young lady whose face will fit this leopard print antiviral mask. Equerry, open the golden casket. Right you are, sire. You need look no further, Prince Charming, for I am the lady you seek. Here, let me try the mask. What do you think? It's an undoubted improvement, but your wall eye makes me somewhat doubt you are the woman I seek. What about me, big boy? I don't happen to be attached. No, and I don't happen to be surprised. What about me? Let me try on the mask. Forgive me, madam, but simple observation leads me to believe that your nose may be somewhat too ample for the mask in question. Cheeky bastard! Excuse me, stepmama. But may I take the tea things away? Who is this? I understood there were no more women to be found in the house. She is of no importance, sire. She's just a simple scullery maid. You need not waste your time with this baggage. Nevertheless, I would be failing in my quest if I did not do my princely duty and examine all the ladies in my kingdom, however humble they might be. Besides, I'm quite partial to a bit of rough on occasion. So I offer the mask to the young scullery maid, sire? Yes. And turn that bloody fanfare off! It's doing my head in! Sorry, sire. Come here, girl. Put this on. Certainly, sire. Great heavens! Your eyes! They seem so... so reminiscent. What can you see, sire? Something I've glimpsed before. Something truly wonderful. What is it, sire? Two, two tiny little reflections of me. Try to focus, sire. Remember, you're here to find a wife. Good heavens, you sound just like the prince. Which one of you said that? I did. That's right, he did. This is preposterous. I can't tell who's speaking, particularly when you're wearing those silly antiviral masks, because you both sound exactly the same. One of you will have to hold your hand up when you speak. There you are. I said it was a ridiculous idea for us to be played by the same person. Well, don't blame me. I was only trying to help out. In that case, you should have offered to play a role in a scene I'm not in. Then there wouldn't be a problem. What if one of us was to do our lines in a high squeaky voice? That's a good idea. All right, you can do your bit in a high squeaky voice. Then people won't get us mixed up. I don't see why I should play my part in a high squeaky voice. Why don't you do your part in a high squeaky voice? I can't. It would undermine my credibility as the prince. What about my credibility as the equerry? You're a fundamentally unimportant character, so it doesn't matter. The whole plot pivots around my actions. That's a bit strong. Excuse me, do you think we could return to the plot? Keep your nose out of it. Yeah, why don't you shove off? Which one of you said that? He, he did. did. 
That showed her. Do you know? I think I've rather misjudged you, Nigel. And I think I've rather misjudged you, sire. It seems to me that as we played by the same person, we could very possibly have lots in common. I was thinking much the same thing myself, sire. Tell me, have you tried on the mask? No, I haven't. Well, why don't you have a go? Do you think I should? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. All right then, let me take my current one off. There. It feels a bit tight. Oh, I don't think so. It does press down rather hard on my nose. That's a minor problem. I think it actually rather suits you. Do you really think so? Yes, I do. Do you know what, Nigel? I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Why do you say that, Sarah? Because I think I found my bride. <laughs> And so the prince takes his equity into lawfully wedded civil partnership. And since both parts are played by the same actor, they live happily ever after. And when a little later, old King Creole dies from the fairy flu, they run the kingdom jointly. Their joint sovereignty proves to be a... Wait a minute, what about me? I'm supposed to be the major character in this. It is my name in the title, after all. Okay, um, how about, um, and Cinderella runs off with her fairy old mother, and they also both live happily ever after. Oh, bugger. I suppose it'll have to do. It's me again, just spotting in one final time to say that if you have enjoyed this U3A pantomime, it might be advisable to contact your nearest GP for a checkup, since you could be suffering from one of the early symptoms of COVID-19, a severe loss of taste. And now it's back to Aladdin and the 40 Thieves. Cinderella! That was the 2020 Krakowl U3A pantomime. It starred lots of people who should really have known better. They were Dee McElroy as Cinderella. For I am friends with all the little creatures in the house. Oliver Barton as the narrator. As Cinderella vanishes into the night, Prince Charming pursues her, rushing down the stairs as fast as his stand of stairlift will take him. Judith Dana as Prince Charming and the Equerry. I bid you greetings, Lady Harder. You must wonder why I am abroad on a night like this. Goethe Fuster as King Creole. Get in there, boy. Afia Willett as Buttons. Remember, it was me who christened you, Cinders, because I think you're a hot bit of stuff. Gabrielle Smith as the U3A representative. The U3A is a trusting, dynamic organisation. Marilyn Smith as the wicked stepmother. Don't be absurd, Cinderella. Who would look twice at you? Malcolm Thomas as the fairy coach driver. I had the big bad wolf in the back of his carriage once, you know. He's an absolute sweetie. Pam Knowles as the cat. Meow. Keith Mayton and Sid Fuster as the ugly sisters. We're not transvestites, mother. We're transitioning. Sylvia O'Brien as the butler. No more than eight people in the hall at any one time. You'll have to wait. Rowena Mayton as the cockroach. Oh, you look lovely, Gerald. The sheep. Bah. And Dick Whittington. I'm Dick Whittington and this is my cat. And guest starring George Pendlebury as the fairy old mother. 
I'm gonna wave my little wand about and amazing things will happen. The script was by David Bishop, so you know who to blame, along with lots of other better writers whose work he shamelessly nicked. Why not join us again next year? Unless you found yourself something better to do. Which shouldn't be too hard.